You're listening to Live from Lower North Street, a podcast from the Institute of Economic Affairs. I'm Kate Andrews, news editor at the IEA. Today, I'm talking to the IEA's head of education, Dr. Steve Davies, about the arguments for and against intellectual property rights, a topic that particularly divides the libertarian movement. Coming up, Steve explains the philosophical arguments both for and against, ultimately arguing that copyright law forms a logical conclusion when taken to the extreme. However, Steve thinks certain forms of intellectual property are justifiable and helpful, like trademarks, often because they spring up organically and are recognized by courts rather than determined by state policy. He also points out that as it is becoming increasingly more difficult to monitor copyright infringement, changes to law may be needed for the 21st century. If you like what you hear, be sure to visit our website, iea.org.uk, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, username IEA London. Steve, the issue of intellectual property notably divides the libertarian movement. Why is it that people who broadly share the same views on tax, civil liberties, and government intervention differ on intellectual property? Well, the simple and straightforward answer is because intellectual property raises all kinds of issues of a very profound and basic nature about the nature of what property is, what its relationship to government is, uh, and how we should understand and defend it in the world that we live in. Now, intellectual property strictly means uh, copyrights, patents, uh, trademarks, and trade secrets. Those are the four sort of broad areas. I have to say that the last two of those, trademarks and trade secrets, are not controversial. It's patent and copyright that causes all the arguments. Now, the basic starting point is this. Is intellectual property a natural property right of the same kind as other kinds of property? In other words, is your right to copyright or to a patent in something you've written or invented the same kind of property as what you have in a house or a physical possession or something of that kind? Now, some people are actually prepared to argue that it is. Uh, But quite frankly, that's a totally bonkers position, if I may use the vernacular, because (laughs) if you believe that, you will be forced by logic to all kinds of truly bizarre conclusions. Because, for example, uh, property in, say, a piece of land or a building uh, remains in place as long as the building or the piece of land is still in existence. Now, if that were to apply to, let's say, a uh, copyright of ideas or of publications, then, for example, you would not be allowed to quote from the American Declaration of Independence or cite ideas from it without making a payment to the estate of Thomas Jefferson, the, pres- the presumed author of those ideas. And when you start to think about it this way, you begin to realise that actually that's simply uh, an impossible concept. It leads to completely bizarre conclusions. So in reality, uh, apart from a few rather strange libertarians, the so-called Gallimbosi, and others, uh, most people believe that intellectual property is not the same as other kinds of property. Now, historically, that's accurate, because intellectual property has always been created by sovereign rulers, whether kings and princes or states. Uh, One of the defined powers of a sovereign state is the ability to create patents and copyrights. That's one of the designated powers that the US Constitution gives to the Congress, for example. It's one of their list of powers that they have. Now, this means that they're purely a creation of public power, and they have certain features that no other kind of property does. Uh, The most obvious one being that uh, they're time-limited. Nobody has a perpetual patent or a perpetual copyright. And so the justification for the existence of these kinds of property is not that they're a natural right or that they have spontaneously evolved. It's that their existence brings about some kind of public benefit. And the public benefit is meant to be that you have more artistic uh, works created if they're protected by copyright. You have more uh, and better novels being written, songs being composed, music being composed uh, than would otherwise be the case. And that in the case of patents, it gives an incentive to invent new processes, new devices, uh, new kinds of productive devices of one kind or other that otherwise would not be there because people would not expect to enjoy uh, a 20 or 25 year higher than average income. So essentially what intellectual property does is to create a time limited monopoly for the holder of the copyright or the patent, which like any monopoly, uh, gives a rent an increased income to the holder of the intellectual property, which they otherwise would not enjoy. And this is defended on the basis that it yields an observable public benefit. Now, the uh, majority of libertarians who support 
intellectual property do so, therefore, on consequentialist grounds. They argue that as a matter of public policy, uh, intellectual property leads to incentives which significantly benefit the broader population. On the other hand, the counter view uh, is that this is actually a monopoly, uh, just like any other created by the state, and that just like any monopoly, it actually has harmful effects. Uh, and in fact, if anything, intellectual property like patents are a disincentive to innovation rather than an incentive, and that in fact we do not need any kind of intellectual property to encourage creativity or innovation. Uh, the lack of copyright in 16th century England, for example, doesn't seem to have inhibited William Shakespeare very much, uh, despite the fact that once he'd put on a play, there was nothing to stop anybody else you know, copying it, producing another version of it. In fact, that kind of thing did used to happen quite frequently. Italy didn't have intellectual property of any kind until 1970 of all times, and yet again, it didn't seem to hamper the production of great art, great music, uh, and a whole lot of other things besides in Italy throughout that period. So the argument essentially is one about consequences of the existence or lack of intellectual property. But it, as I said initially, it does raise interesting questions at the philosophical level, because it does raise the question of what property is, where it comes from, uh, and what the ultimate justification for it is. And so it's one of those issues that also tends to divide natural rights libertarians on the one hand, who tend to be sympathetic to the claim that intellectual property is, at least in some sense, based on a natural right, usually a Lockean one, that it's the product of your mind and your labour, and therefore you have a property right in it, from other libertarians who take a broadly consequentialist view and who think that ultimately uh, intellectual property stands or falls on the basis of uh, how far it contributes to the broader public benefit. You mentioned the U.S. Constitution before, but let's take this into a very modern context. You have artists like Taylor Swift who are trying to trademark catchphrases in her songs and campaigning for increased copyright protections. Surely there must be a way, with or without copyright law, that we could recognize these famous quotes, whether it's from the Constitution or from a Taylor Swift song, and hold people to account if they were to try to use them as their own. This is a very interesting question, and, and this is the kind of specific question that raises the difficult issues that surround the whole question of intellectual property. If I was to reproduce an entire Taylor Swift song, I think most people would say that I had copied her. And if you support the existence of copyright, you would say I'd violated her, her copyright. On the other hand, if I were to sample, as they say, a part of one of her songs, maybe a catchphrase or a particular uh, piece of music, a couple of bars of music, uh, would that constitute a copyright violation? Uh, well, the current uh, law actually says that it does. Uh, there's the famous uh, case of uh, Vanilla Ice, where uh, a song he did was held to have violated the copyright of a previous group. Uh, he claimed it hadn't because he'd put an extra ding in the <laughs> uh, rhythm, but that the courts found that that wasn't a sufficient defence. Now, the problem, however, is this. If you have created a work of art of some kind, such as a piece of music or a musical composition or a poem or a work of literature, it remains yours to do what you will with as long as you have kept it private. But by actually publishing the work or performing it in a public place, in some sense you have put it into the public domain. It's no longer clear that it's yours to control in that way. Now, if that were the case, then, for example, every time the supporters at a football club uh, sing La Donna e Mobile, or rather a rude song to the tune of that famous song from uh, Ver the Verdi Opera, uh, then they ought to be paying uh, royalties right. to whoever owns the copyright. So if people adapt uh, a current pop song, and again, various very rude chants have been sung at football songs involving uh, tunes like Agadoo, believe it or not, recently in the public domain, are they violating a property right? Well, if Taylor Swift has her way, yes, they are. But that shows you just how difficult this is. Wow, imagine if dirty football chants were responded to. Um, with copyright uh, yeah, with suits, yes. Yes, that would, that would be something else. Um, so th this, you've obviously highlighted the reasons that you are very skeptical of issues like intellectual property. What protections on intellectual property, if any at all, do you think are warranted? Well, I would... Broadly speaking, at the philosophical level, I am actually against intellectual property. I think the concept is ultimately incoherent. However, having said that... Uh, I can see certain kinds of intellectual property that are justified. Uh, for example, trademarks, which I already mentioned. One of the reasons why I think trademarks are 
a valuable and justifiable form of intellectual property is that they arise spontaneously. Uh, They're not created by a sovereign act of the political power. They're typically recognised by the courts as being a means by which two parties, the consumer uh, and the producer, uh, can each ensure something. The consumer can be sure the product they're buying is what it purports to be, and the producer can be sure that uh, their product is distinguished from other rival imitations. Now, that hasn't been created by princes. The courts have recognised it, basically, and there's a procedure then set up to do it. So the very first ever trademark, the Bass Red Triangle on beer, uh, was not the product of a legislative enactment. It was a court recognition. So I have no problem with that. Trade secrets also seem to me a relatively trivial case, and also the whole point about them is they're not made public, so they don't have the problem I mentioned earlier. With patents and copyrights, I would be not too unhappy with the kind of regime that we had in most countries until roughly the later 1970s. The problem is that since then, mainly due to the change in course undertaken by the United States Patent Office and the US judicial system, the scope and application of intellectual property law has become enormously extended. All kinds of things are now given patents or granted copyright protection, which would never have attracted that protection uh, before then. Uh, And the courts have also become very aggressive in protecting uh, intellectual property. And we now have the phenomenon of, for example, uh, two well-known companies being involved in a lawsuit because one claims the other one has violated a patent, not on any particular technology, but on the shape of a mobile phone. Mm. This is quite simply ridiculous. And what it shows is that actually the current form that intellectual property is taking is definitely hampering and hindering innovation through emulation of other products rather than encouraging it. But that's a more contingent phenomenon. You can still believe in intellectual property, uh, but think that the way the system is working at the moment, which, as I say, is driven largely by the agenda of one particularly powerful country, the United States, uh, is mistaken and damaging and dangerous. So that's a kind of intermediate position between the sort of purest opposition to intellectual property and the straightforward defense of the status quo. It's a bit ironic that in 2017, when we have more and more protections on intellectual property and have been gaining them, I also think in many ways we're seeing people break those laws very consistently. When you look at things like social media in particular, Twitter, Mm. Facebook, people are just pulling images. Are we going to have to address those laws at some point in the way that people are breaking them? But I mean, millions of people just across the spectrum. I think ultimately, yes. And that's a slightly separate issue, which is the question of how far you can continue to have or enforce a property right when it becomes, for technological reasons, impossible to Mm -hmm. do so. Technology can create the possibility of having property in areas where this previously was not the case, uh, but it can also, as in this case, undermine uh, the existence of a property right. And you mentioned things like downloading images from the internet and so on. Uh, Perhaps even more serious is the capacity to download significant large amounts of copyrighted material, such as music, for example, uh, or film through streaming devices of one kind or another, streaming programs on various platforms. And I think that this increasingly is making it very, very difficult to actually enforce the existing copyright system in a whole number of areas, such as music, film, increasingly also literature, but particularly in those first two media. Steve, fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've been listening to the IEA's Dr. Steve Davies and Kate Andrews. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, username IEA London.